Thank you very much. Uh, it is the Late Show. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we'd like to just uh, say a big uh, hello to our main researcher tonight and all the work, <laughs> Nikki Mills. Thank Hello. you so much, Nikki. You're welcome. Yeah. I'm glad you're here with me, though, Howard, because yeah, I do oh, have some questions just, for you. <laughs> I'll try not to fall asleep, OK? <laughs> it's only because uh, I work for this slave company. <laughs> well, that is a good introduction to the beginning <laughs> yeah. of the programme, because today we are going to be talking about how we can help stop modern slavery. Because you hear the term slavery, and it kind of takes you back to history, doesn't it? You don't really think it's happening here in the 21st century or even in the UK but it is happening and tonight we're going to shed some light on that and hopefully educate you um, in, in modern slavery what kind of forms this takes and we're also going to have some video clips from a lady called Kath Johnson who works for the International Justice Mission UK who is a charity that works to stop human trafficking and slavery and forced labour and that kind of thing so we'll have some insights from her with the work that she's been doing and some other things as well and we are live and interactive, so we'd love to hear from you tonight. So you can email in live at revelationtv.com or text the number on your screen. If you've witnessed any slavery or sadly if you've been experienced any slavery or if you've been on the other side of the coin where you've helped help uh, protect people and victims that have been part of slavery, then we would love to hear your insights tonight. Do email in and let us know. So Howard, have you experienced or witnessed or anything in regards of modern slavery in the 21st century? I wish you hadn't asked that question. Uh, okay. I did as a child. I was oh, okay. 16 years of oh. age. I was signed uh, to work for a, a very famous band, a musician, a group. And uh, at the age of 16, I was signed to work, guess what, seven days a week. Gosh. Um, after about nine months, I had a breakdown, ended up in hospital. And I was told that, um, you know, because I said, look, we've got these gigs with us with this famous band and we were working every night. But how come a 16-year-old could be forced to work seven days a week? Okay, that was my question. I'm actually doing my life stories bit right now and I've come across that and I, I find it really a tragic part of my life because I actually, my mum uh, took him to court um, because obviously, you know, as I ended up in hospital and the manager had said, look, don't worry, because I said, look, we've got to get out, I've got to get out of hospital, you know, I'll, I'll come, come back to work. And they said, no, no, it's okay. And then they welched on that and, and also my drum kit disappeared. And uh, my mother ended up with nothing. Oh. It took three years to go to court and the judge said, no, this is, this is the law. It set a precedent, but it didn't last that long. Um, it's Conde v. Baronites. And, uh, and now that I'm reflecting on it, I was thinking, how on earth could that happen? I mean, it was genuinely ended up in hospital, so I should have at least had a sick note, right? I would have qualified for that. Definitely. And now the judge said, no, you have to work, if you signed a contract, a 10-year contract, to work seven nights a week. Okay if I was an adult, but I was 16 years of age, and I wasn't, the, the rest of the band were actually about four or five years older than me, so they were in their 20s, you know? And uh, yeah, I, I, that, I, I did actually say it was a bit Dickensian, and looking at it and what's happening today, a bit of slave uh, slavery there, I would have thought. Yeah, 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 that definitely would come under child labour, and it is very sad how even today there is child labour. It's the, the innocent and the vulnerable that are forced into these situations, and normally because they are in some sort of poverty or in some need of money, and they feel like that's the only way. So sometimes, especially in um, impoverished countries, they have to send their children out to work, literally back break and work, where we have to carry things, and, and their bodies just aren't strong enough yeah. to do that. And, and like you say, even in, in the UK, when children are forced to have to work so much like that and to be exploited just to have an extra mm -hmm. pair of hands or whatever it is for the success of other people, because that's what modern slavery is. It's exploiting people for personal or financial gain. Um, and it can take many forms, including sex trafficking, child exploitations, forced labor on farms and building sites. Um, and people can become trapped in making clothes, picking crops and working in factories. And I've got some facts and figures here that are actually quite shocking it's 15 million people worldwide are in modern slavery 28 million people around the world are now trapped in forced labor an increase of 2.7 million since 2016 an increase which the international labor organization attributes to the combined effects of the covid 19 pandemic conflict and climate change more than 100,000 people in the UK are in modern slavery. Victims can be any age and any gender. They may, may feel unable to leave because they are scared or owe money to their exploiter. Some might not think of themselves as a victim. 
52% of the population have spotted people they think are victims of modern slavery, but only 35 of those have raised their concerns with police or others, often because they are scared to do so. And slavery is common with supply chains of products that we buy, such as clothing, food supplies and mobile phones. So it's just shocking statistics then, the amount of people that feel they are forced to work or they're forced to do things they're uncomfortable with because of things such as the COVID-19 pandemic, conflict and climate change. What do you make of that? Yeah, well, I mean, they're appalling. I, actually, but you, she made me think about even my own situation because I was outside living in a caravan that the water, my hot water bottle froze in the bed one night. We had the, probably one of the worst winters of that particular um, century. Um, it was 1963, very, very cold winter. But uh, the conditions that I was living in were really bad. I was living in the backyard of a pub uh, in this caravan. And uh, it, wa it, it just was unfair. And the thing was, I got uh, sacked because I couldn't go out and perform uh, those seven days a week uh, because I was in hospital. But, um, you know, so um, there you go. It's just one of those things. And we lost the case about three years later. My mum took it to court. Um, and the, the, the only people that had any sympathy, sympathy for us was the press, funnily enough. They said, you know what, son? You know what they say about the law? It's an ass. You know, I wasn't sure it was parked outside the back of the caravan or not. <laughs> no, seriously, it is yeah. really tragic. So I can relate to it in, in some way. Um, but it, when you're looking at what people are having to go through, and there, it is forced labour, um, and very sadly there's not enough justice in the world mm. to actually put that right. But God sees everything, Amen. you know, and one day it's payback time. Yeah. How did it feel as a 16 year old having to work? Was you feeling the pressure of having to help look after your mum and have the money come in and obviously your health deteriorating? How did it no. all affect you? Well, my mum was living back in the north of England and I was down south um, and the band uh, were based there. But it was like, um, you know, normally you get a day off. I mean, you might get an odd day off, but sometimes we were playing at more than one gig a night. Um, we're traveling from right John O'Groats to Land's End sort of thing all over the country. Uh, we did have sleeping beds inside the, the tour bus. But, you know, as a 16 year old, it was really hard. And after nine months, I pretty much was exhausted. And uh, that's that's where I ended up in hospital. But yeah, it's, um, it, was a, it was an abuse. Yeah, um, exactly. And yeah. also what disappeared was my drum kit and I never got it back. It's a crime in it's itself. A, yeah, and my <laughs> yeah, mum was a widow it. and she had to sell her home in the end mm. back to actually um, look after me in, down in London. I was a bit selfish, I suppose, but a 16 year old, you don't know, I needed another drum kit and she brought that, bought that for me, bless her heart, you know. Yeah. Sold her home, sold up. Um, yeah, she, she had to go through a lot a widow at that as well. And those hard-nosed guys were, uh, were having no sympathy whatsoever. Mm, that's really sad. Well, Slave drivers yeah. in, in the music Hopefully. business. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing, Howard, and do remember we are live and interactive, so we'll come to your email shortly if you've experienced something similar to Howard or you've witnessed it or you've able to help someone get out of that, then do please email in live at revelationtv.com or text the number that will be coming up on your screen. But I did mention at the beginning of the programme we do have Kath Johnson, who's going to be giving us some videos throughout this evening from the International Justice Mission UK. Um, but before we go on to that, let's just have a, a video about um, IJM is what we call it for sure and they are fighting to end slavery for good take a look at this video so this is the target establishment for a suspect you for our victims and remember if there's a hazard or dangerous situation move yourself to a position of comfort we've run it all over to the police and found out that they were in fact trafficked and they were in fact slaves. These little kids are on this boat. They are not fed. They are abused beyond imagination. We got to touch you up. This is the girl. Whenever something like this comes, I imagine in my mind that girl is found. We have operations all over the world, rescuing people from slavery. 
because today there are criminals who abuse children, sell girls. How old is she? 12. 12? How much? 30? Yeah, yeah, maybe. And force families into slavery. Criminals prey on the easiest target, the world's poor, because they expect no one to defend them. Pareho po tayong mga tao. Hindi po tayo ipagay or hayo na pwedeng gamitin lang sa pansarili. But today, there are thousands of people gathering to seek justice for those in slavery. We are a group of lawyers, counselors, activists, and supporters. We are called International Justice Mission. And together, we form the largest international anti-slavery organization in the world. But slavery won't come to an end until criminals know they can't get away with it. So we partner with local police to arrest and prosecute criminals. This sends a message to slave owners. We will not go away. We stay with the survivors until they are healed, until they are free. Natulungan po ng IJM sa pamamigitan po na sa case ko, sa pagtulong po nila na ma-overcome ko po yung, yung fear. Each year, we rescue thousands of slaves and protect millions around the world. We are transforming how justice systems protect their citizens. To those who are still enslaved, we promise to find you. We will get you home to your families so you can have the freedom you deserve. So that's just some of the work that IJM are doing to help the victims of slavery and to rescue them. And there are other charities that we will be talking about later in the programme, such as Tear Fund and Compassion UK as well. They've teamed up um, to do an initiative in relation to the World Cup, which will come to shortly. But just want to thank you to IJM UK for, for being able to show, uh, being able to let us to show that, that um, video and just show them some of the work that they are doing. So thank you for that. Um, some of your emails are coming in. Um, we've got one here from Ian. Um, he says, hi, how Howard and Nikki, this subject touches my heart in a powerful way. Some years ago, I came back from Northern Ireland and was homeless in my home city of Glasgow. So attended a very liberal place called Glasgow City Mission who helped me. But during that time, I met a prostitute woman, a very bonny young woman who literally begged me to stay with her. And as a young Christian, I freaked out and said, I have too much respect for women to go with you. Please let me pray for you and let you get something to eat. So I did. Finally, and to finish, less than a month later, that woman was dead. Heartbreaking. Something needs to be done. I know that Roman Catholic Church have women who go out to minister to women in prostitution, and we need more of this from the church at large. Thanks so much for the show, and God bless you all at Revelation TV. And may God sustain Revelation TV, I pray in Yeshua's name, mm. from Evangelist Ian at Sharp from Glasgow in Scotland. It's such a sad story, but it just goes to show that there is sex trafficking out there, there's human trafficking, that people are forced into things that they don't want to be doing either for the gain of the person that, that's selling them. They even sell children in some countries. At the age of 12, they're selling them for 30 pounds, I think it was, for, for men to take them and to do these horrific things, and it's just terrible. Yeah, I, I, I don't know whether it's just become, becoming more aware of what's been going on, uh, or there's an increase. Do you know what the stats are? Not for trafficking. the inc not for trafficking. I did have there was an increase in uh, forced labour due to the COVID pandemic, conflicts, and climate change. Right. Um, but when it comes to trafficking, I don't have any facts and figures as such. But it would seem to be on the increase because of the the migration situation alone. People yeah, are finding what do yeah, they do, yeah. uh, or perhaps there's a disaster in the area and they lose their house, or they lose their job, or their means to to provide food. 
and therefore they find themselves having to, you know, be, be duped, if you like, and taken for granted and taken into um, some sort of slavery of some sort or yeah, another, yeah. whether it's forced labour or sexual um, conduct or whatever it yeah. is. Yeah, we've got a list here, there's different types of um, slavery as well, like you mentioned there's forced labour which uh, someone is forced to work or provide a service against their will for little or no wages. It's typical in industries where a lot of labour is needed from clothing factories in South East Asia to fruit picking in the UK and as we mentioned poverty is such a big um, driver of this, the fact that yeah. people are vulnerable, they need work, they need the money so they just take whatever they can but they're in exploitive situations um, and worryingly for the first time in decades, the number of people living in extreme poverty globally is increasing, meaning that now is a crucial time to intervene and protect them from exploitation. We've talked about child labour as well, how children take on work that their bodies aren't equipped for, it denies them of opportunities for play and education, um, but yet many parents are unaware of the damage it does or feel like they have no choice. And uh, child labour can also include forced marriages or to even become sex workers or soldiers or work as a servant in a household. Mm -hmm. Very, very sad. Yeah, well, you were saying the forced marriage is something, an estimated 22 million people are living in forced marriages and these include people in the upper middle income as well as high income countries. You know, so why would that be su uh, su on such an increase as there is? Uh, the true figure says, however, it's particularly those uh, children under age of 16 are thought to be in far greater danger, of course, because they're more vulnerable. Exactly, they can't, yeah. and they probably, a lot of them will be, be amused. They will think, well, is this what I'm expected to do? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and sort of not have anybody to support them to say otherwise. You know. Yeah. Human trafficking, as we talked about, someone is moved by force, threats or deception in order to exploit them in some way and it can include being made to commit crimes such as drug dealing and foreign women being trafficked to the UK to work in the sex industry, as we've talked about. And there's also bondage labour, uh, which is uh, debt bondage. And this is the world's most common form of slavery. It's when a person borrows money and has to work to pay off the debt. Often victims are trapped by exorbitant interest on the debt. Now, that's probably one that, as it says, is most quite common. And especially as we've got a cost of living crisis right now, that's probably something that a lot of people are going to be in debt with inflation going up mm. and having to, to work and they're not getting their wages risen so they have to maybe borrow and they're in debt and then they could end up having to do this These money thing. lenders yeah that uh, I think there was a program that I was watching the other day or, or whether it was a news item or not I can't remember but there were the police going in and arresting uh, these money lenders which are you know just probably in your neighborhood and they're living in their own houses but they get involved in lending money and then of course the exorbitant interest rates they get compounded if they're late and then the other thing, of course, which is very prevalent in our society today, is the the druggery, the drugs. And uh, if you're taking drugs, or you know you're buying from the people, they will, you know, you might run up a bill, and then find yourself that you can't pay that. And of course, then they come back um, and really put the squeeze on the person who's taking the drugs, but also the family who is at threat as well, who, you know, mum and dad or whatever, or somebody else in the family is under threat as well you know so it's when you look at all this it's not very nice news it's is not, it you it's know so and it's, it's sad that we have to do a program like this but i thought it was important because we don't talk about it enough and I don't think we know about it enough and I think it's important for us to, to know that these things are happening, to be educated about it, to be enlightened about it and as, as I was saying, it's, it's happening around us all the time and we don't even notice it so we do have a video that Kath Johnson from IMJ has also prepared for us talking about the signs of modern slavery and how we can look out for it. Hi, my name is Kath and I'm the Church and Community Mobilisation Lead at IJM UK and I have the privilege of working for the International Justice Mission, or IJM to our friends, which is one of the largest anti-slavery organisations in the world and has a mission to protect people in poverty from violence. Violence such as slavery, which comes in the form of the family who are held in debt bondage in a brick kiln in South Asia or the young boy who is trafficked and forced to work in the fishing industry on Lake Baltic in Ghana, or the young Romanian woman who is trafficked to the UK for sex work, having been promised a job in a factory. 
The reality is that forced labour and other forms of slavery happen everywhere. It's rife in the, in the supply chains of the smartphones we use and in the clothes that we wear. Modern slavery is a real problem here in the UK too, with an estimated 100,000 people trapped in slavery. That means slavery is hidden in plain sight all around us. And so if you're listening to this today and are aware of someone you think might be being exploited, perhaps they seem under the control of someone else, perhaps they're unable to move around freely, or maybe they're showing signs of physical or psychological abuse, then it's important to report it to the police immediately, of course. But ultimately, this is a systemic problem and while members of the public reporting signs of slavery is super helpful, we need to see action on a whole systems level to make real change possible. This means things like working alongside police to help them effectively deal with cases of slavery, supporting victims through the justice process and helping them rebuild their lives and making sure, of course, that the government prioritises victim support. Thank you to Kath for that and thank you for so many of you that are emailing in this evening. We'll go to some of these now. Um, this one, it says, Hi brother Howard and sister Nikki. I'm aware of Compassion UK, which is another charity fighting to stop slavery. Um, for a sponsor, two precious wee girls, though then to help them get education. One from Burkina Faso and another from Indonesia. I'm sure they do a great work to rid slavery. Also organisations like Barnabas Aid and Release International, who you guys have had on Revelation TV, along with Open Doors, and are you both aware this is happening in a large way among our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world. Women tend to be the ones who suffer worst as they seem are not worthy in some nations. Mm. King to know how you feel we should tackle this and especially what Nikki thinks as a young woman knowing what's happening to other women some of our sisters like yourself Nikki in this world who are poor well it is absolutely terrible that that women in certain countries aren't even looked at with any worth and value at all and how they have no rights or anything it's really really sad and especially now that I've been doing this research I think it is important for us to to support these charities all the ones you've mentioned and the ones that we're featuring tonight because they know where to look they've got the resources to be able to go and find these people and support these people people physically, mentally, spiritually as well. All these charities that we've mentioned are Christian charities so they know what to do um, to go in there and help them mentally as well. So I think all we can do is just be praying for these people as well and really um, just support the charities that you're seeing coming up on your screen now. And if you just search them in Google, find their websites and just see how, how you can get involved in, um, in helping them out and uh, yeah, get involved with that. Um, yeah, very, very sad situation that, these, that some of these people are living in. I think it's worth looking at some of the scriptures. I just looked, one came to mind, Nikki, you know, because often this is a scripture that's used by people who want to find fault with the Bible. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that's, people would say that, you know, they had slaves in biblical times, um, but how did they treat them? And one of the things that um, the Apostle Paul wrote was is in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 to 8, it says, slaves, be obedient to your human masters with fear and trembling. And it might sound very cruel at this, at this beginning here, but insincerity of heart as of Christ, which is Paul instructing slaves to obey their master. Similar statements regarding obedient slaves can be found in uh, other scriptures. But basically what I think there was a, a slave, was it Anomissimus? I think it was. Very hard for me to say being <laughs> dyslexic. Um, you know, he was one who was one of the uh, slaves of someone that the disciples knew. But he was asked, the, 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 the owner of that particular slave was asked by the apostles to look after that particular slave and, and be really kind and considerate. And I think in the early biblical days, people found themselves, they were called slaves, but they weren't, it wasn't forced labor. They were either because of, um, falling into debt, they went to work for the person, but God made sure, according to his law, that those slaves were treated as humans and not abused and not yeah. taken advantage yeah. of. Um, so, you know, 
I don't know, I'll see if I can find some more while you're also chatting away there. Well, Les has emailed in in regards to that. It says, the Bible does not condone slavery, but recognises its existence. In Old Testament time, under Hebrew law, slaves were treated as human beings with dignity and not as animals. They were not oppressed as the slaves in other nations. God did not create people to control one another and Jesus sets the captives free in Luke 4, 18. He has given us free will of our own and will not force us to do anything against our will. Mm. To subject a person to the bondage of slavery is to take that God-given freedom away from them. Slavery results from the fall of man and is a product of the curse. Yeah, uh, there's one in, there's a couple here I found. Um, Exodus 21. It says that here there the are certain laws about how to treat slaves. It says, when a man strikes his slave, male or female, with a rod and the slave dies, under his hands shall he be avenged, a life for a life, basically. So it wasn't like it was disregarded. It showed that there was, you know, in God's eyes, they were equal, okay? Um, anyone who beats his slave, male or male, uh, this is the same, same one there. Um, it's indentured servitude uh, is mentioned there in Exodus chapter 21 verses 1 to 11 it says when you buy a male Hebrew slave he shall serve six years but on the seventh he shall go out as a free person now in those days as well they had what was called the Jubilee year um, this was to protect people's uh, inheritance because mm. there were every every tribe had their own land allotted to them. And on that land would be, you know, usually it was farming, okay? There would be a farm, okay? And that was the way that the family was allowed to make its living. Now, the thing is that if it, every 49th on the 50th year, there was what's called the Jubilee year. So if that family or any member in that generation of 49 years was to fall into debt for any reason, okay, then he would actually be allowed, if you like, to let somebody else take over, the person who he's indebted to, if it was sufficient enough of the debt, to take over their farm or their freehold, okay? But only till the end of the 49th year. So say, for example, 30 years in, somebody comes along, one of the sons is a bit of a waster, his dad has died, you know, so he's, and he gambles away, or whatever he does, he falls into hard time. It could be because of a famine or something like that in the land. So on, in comes the person who um, holds the debt and he takes over the farm or the freehold. And, um, but on the 49th year, God had made sure that the, all those times and that whether it was hardship would be wiped out, cancelled, a reset button. So the family got back their God-given inheritance of that particular property. So it stopped people, uh, if you like it, getting worse over generations where eventually the family had nothing. So I think that's, that's, that's another type of servitude, mm. but, it, it, but God had a plan to make sure it wasn't gonna be harmful to the next generation and the next and the next and so on. As you were talking about that, it reminded me of the scripture in Leviticus that talks about, it's in ver uh, chapter 19, verse 9. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field right. or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. And there's so many scriptures I've got written down of the Bible talking about looking after the poor and needy and not to be greedy and take everything for yourself, but leave things for the poor and needy. And, and I think it's just so sad to see how the world is at the moment because there is enough money in the world for everybody to live comfortably. But sadly, yeah. you've got, as we've been seeing on our screens, poverty in such countries. And I think if we followed what God tells us and teaches us, then we'd all be able to live comfortably and happily. Yeah. What was so lovely, again, it shows you God's heart for people, for the poor, yeah. that um, it was Naomi and um, Ruth that came back from Moab, where they'd been living for a long time. There was a famine there in the land and they, and, uh, Naomi came back, she was the Jew, Ruth was, had married her son mm -hmm. and she was a Moabite, but she decided to return to Israel um, and there was poverty. They were very poor, but the, the gleaning law was very helpful to them, but it did mean it's quite clever really, instead of like just getting the dole and sitting at home watching TV, with all due respect, some do, I know, because I've got somebody in my family, not immediate family, 
who has spent his whole life doing that, okay? So I can speak with experience. But you see what the clever thing there was that the people who were poor had to go at the end of the, the day, towards the end of the day, uh, when the workers were stopped, and they were able to glean, which is to pick up the bits that were left over from the farmer. And the farmer was not, like the vineyard grower, was not allowed to take everything. They had to leave for the poor, but it meant they were looked after the poor, had something to eat and something to drink, or even to eat if you want to just eat the grapes. But also at the same time, they were able with dignity to provide for themselves, yeah. but they worked. Yeah. It did, it did. And I think it's so important. Why, why, from a biblical perspective, is it important to look after the poor and needy and not to be fo so focused on, especially at this time at the moment, we're all going through a cost of living crisis. We're kind of all focused on our own worries in, in our own households. But yeah. how can we still be helping others within that? Oh, there's loads of ways. I mean, it, it, it's it's, it's what, how you choose to do it. But the reason I believe that people have wealth, especially in the kingdom of God and within Christianity, um, that God blesses those who bless others. Mm -hmm. And that you have to um, help. If you see someone in need, the Bible says, and you have the means to meet that need, then you're obligated to give, uh, whether it's finances or a home or whatever. Um, you know, we, we've got a situation where we, we've got a uh, Ukrainian family with us, okay? You know, we, we were right out there in the front, you know, offering our home uh, because we have spare bedrooms now the children have grown up, hopefully. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and the thing is that that was something we wanted to do and they've been with us now over, just over six months. And it was uh, quite moving really because I wasn't there because I've been here in Spain, but Leslie said they were, the family were really worried. There's three of them in the family, a daughter, uh, mum and dad, and they were really worried. And Leslie sensed there was something wrong. You know, what, what's wrong? You know, eventually they said, well, you know, it's the end of the six months. We don't know what's going to happen. And, and well, Leslie said, well, of course you can stay, you know. Um, and they just burst into tears, you know. Uh, so, but so there's always a way to meet a need uh, in different ways. And I think you've just got to be sensitive enough. And if you have the means, financial means or uh, or the space or whatever it is, because it varies in whatever business you're in or whatever you have. You might be able to do it with finances, you know, so you'd see a need and you just meet it. That's the thing. Amen. Thank you. Amen, definitely. Thank you, Howard. We've got some of your emails coming in. Um, Alex in Scotland says, I remember reading a few years ago of Vinet, Vin Vin I can't say this Vietnamese. word. Thank you. Oh, yes. Right, yes. <laughs> Young man caught running a cannabis farm. That's what I'm here for, you know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to help me speak. Uh, this young man was caught running a cannabis farm in a posh rented house in the Scottish Highlands. The poor man was a slave and the judge was sympathetic but still had to sentence him while the criminal gang was nowhere to be seen. This crime was in a quiet residential area, very sad and nearer than what we think. Blessings from Alex mm. in Scotland. And yes, yeah. criminal exploitation is out there as well where criminals use others to do the drug dealing for them mm. so that they don't get caught as well. So that is sad that he was still had to be sentenced as well. It's a pity he was in the Highlands. I'd never know with Howard if he's joking or not. <laughs> well, he, must, he was high. Oh, Sorry. I see that, I see that. Mary says, this week the born again actor that played the Lord Jesus in The Passion of the Christ has told of the wicked torture and murder of children he has actually witnessed in the Hollywood industry. Everyone needs to hear what he has to say. Love from Mary. That is terrible. Thank you, Mary. Um, Eddie says, during the American Civil War, thousands of born-again Christians fought on the side of the Confederate States. Although these people claimed to be saved, they did not comprehend that it's an abom abom abomination to kidnap and abduct millions of innocent men, women and children from Eddie in Birmingham. Yeah. I mean, men have, uh, for generations now, just not quite seen the light or the right side and way to do things. You know, we've made so many mistakes, yeah. incredible. And you know, even uh, even in our country, we we were behind slavery in the sense of making it uh, a, a business. And uh, it wasn't until we had a, it was a Christian that actually uh, changed the laws and fought for the freedom of the slaves. You know, so yeah, so yeah. that was really good. But uh, yeah, we. we <laughs> 
today there's a multiplicity of problems with regards to human trafficking. That's the thing that we've had. I mean, there was a huge earthquake just a couple of days ago. Uh, I think, you know, probably thousands, maybe 30,000 people have lost their livelihood, you know, or their homes. Not so many have lost their lives, but the their infrastructure is destroyed, or it could be that the floods, or, or it's just a, a famine here, or a war there. And, you know, it, it, we now got up to 8 billion people on the planet. And yes, there is actually enough room to house everybody, but there isn't this sort of... They haven't got the finances to to look after or to develop their land the way that we've managed to do it in, say, in the United Kingdom. It is really, it's an unfair world, uh, but that's why we, we pray for God's kingdom to come so that his will will be done on earth uh, as it is in heaven and that men, the wicked men will go. It's, it says that just a little while longer, they will be gone. Then the meek will inherit the earth. Then the poor will inherit the earth. The tables will be turned. Amen, amen. And God sees everything that's happening and he is a just God and, and he's the one that will judge at the end of the day and he will see the evil in the world and he will put them to where they deserve and they will get what's just because he is a fair and loving God. So be encouraged that the world is in disruption at the moment. It is in corruption. But when Jesus comes, he will uh, dry every eye. What does it, does the Bible says, dry every eye? Uh, uh, it, the, 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 there's new heaven, new earth, uh, for which is gone. God is going to introduce and he said every tear would be wiped from their eyes no more mourning no more crying no more wars no more terror by night no more none of the problems which man faces Revelation 21 it's mm -hmm. just beautiful and uh, in God says I'm going to make all things new you know trust me he said every word he speaks he says is true this is what's going to happen yes and mm -hmm. all of those wicked ones it goes on to list them as well so better take note. Well, as a, an example at the moment, of course, the World Cup is happening in Qatar. And of course, a lot of football fans are over there and they've spent a lot of money building the stadium and there's a lot going on over there. But sadly, there has been reports of um, migration, uh, pe migrant workers exploited, injured or killed, working in terrible and brutal conditions to build stadiums and the infrastructure in Qatar. And it says that as families back home grapple with the shock of losing loved ones, they face an uncertain future without a breadwinner. Families may feel they have no choice but to send children to work or into early marriage to make ends meet. Breadwinners who survived but were cheated of wages or injured may remain trapped in debt with dire consequences for their families. So this just goes to show the knock-on effect is that if the breadwinner of the family in a poor country has been flown over to Qatar to build the stadium and if he sadly lost his life, what does the family back home now do? They're going to, maybe there's women and children maybe they're not as educated so now they're going to have to ch send their children into child labor or they're going to be in in debt and have to maybe get into um, send their children into early marriage to make ends meet and I think that's the sad factor is sometimes we can judge people's lives and maybe the prostitute that was talked about earlier why are you in that situation why are you doing that job but you don't see what's happening behind the scenes what's actually happened for them to be in that situation and I think it's just very sad that especially at the moment we're all enjoying the World Cup but we don't know what's happened behind the scenes mm. to get to the place that well, we're at. Well, there's a lot of things that have come to light apparently they're all you know apparently um, got to put that in prefix but it seems that they've been paid pennies per hour mm. um, I mean I know they come from poorer countries a lot of them the migrants that, that have gone into Qatar but they've also been housed in um, what we call containers shipping containers I mean the heat that must be in, inside one of those containers be like in a cooking pot yeah. You know, they haven't got air conditioning, I doubt, you know, if they're in those sort of containers. But the conditions uh, and the way that they've been abused, and some people are saying that they haven't even received their wages still. And, um, and uh, sadly, as you say, some have died because of the working con conditions. I mean, you know, it's a little bit like Egypt and what happened with the Israelites when they went in there to, um, into, what, 400 years, I think, they were there in the end until God sent them Moses and delivered them. I think we all, our Moses today is the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and I was just looking here, another scripture, Nikki, it says in Deuteronomy chapter 28, it says, before my phone dies, 
the Lord your God will bless you in the land he is giving you, and the Lord will establish you as his holy people, talking to the Israel, Israelites at that time, as he promised you on oath, if you keep the commands of the Lord your God and walk in all of his ways, then all the peoples on the earth will see that they are called by my name and they will fear you in that sense. Uh, and I think often the Bible uses the term fear when it means respect. Mm. We fear God because we respect him. We don't fear him like, you know, God, who is, where is he, you know? Um, it's not, it's a respect. Um, and that's whom we want to serve. It's someone who has a heart for the, for the poor and the needy, and God has that, for sure. And it's borne out when you watch uh, the movies, the reenactments of Jesus Christ, the life of, you can see the heart of mm. that man, Amen. you know? And, and, it, and it's great that we have charities like IJ, I, um, I always get this wrong, IJM, Tear Fund and Compassion, who have that heart as well mm. and want to look after the poor and needy. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, they've actually put this initiative together called Justice United. And it's an initiative which is calling on churches, gamers and football fans to unite against injustice. It helps you and your church to engage your congregation and community during the World Cup and take positive action against exploitation at this time. The idea is to fundraise towards the charity via hosting Justed United events with different options for how to fundraise, including playing the PlayStation or Xbox football tournaments and World Cup watch parties. And all the resources you need are on www.justiceunited.org.uk. And we do have Kath back again to tell us more about Justed United. At IJM, we're inspired by our Christian faith and the God who we worship, who tells us throughout the Bible and we see in the life of Jesus, this God is a God who loves justice and pays special attention to the vulnerable. And so we believe that as Christians who are tasked with ushering in God's kingdom here on earth, the church should be at the forefront of the movement to end slavery and violence. And that's what we are passionate to equip and empower here at IJM. So one of the ways we're doing that at the moment is through something called Justice United. And as you'll probably have heard, preparations for this year's World Cup and activities and games have shone a light on the ugly side of the beautiful game with reports of trafficking, forced labour and unjust working conditions affecting workers in Qatar, who is the host country, as you'll know. In response, International Justice Mission, Tear Fund and Compassion have teamed up to launch Justice United which is an initiative encouraging churches to help protect people at risk of exploitation around the world through organising World Cup themed awareness and fundraising events. Together, we're seeking to raise awareness for the fact that forced labour and other types of exploitation happen everywhere, not only in Qatar, and to take positive action to stop it. So if you're part of a church and whether you're interested in football or not, there are a number of ways that you can get involved and invite your community to join in the fun too. So the three ways you can get involved are through gaming, via Xbox or PlayStation football tournaments, through hosting watch parties or through giving. And all funds will go to IJM, Tear Fund and Compassion to tackle poverty and protect people from exploitation around the world. We'll equip you with a video that you can watch as a group or as a church, which highlights issues of exploitation and abuse. We would love you to sign up. And to do this, you can go to justiceunited.org.uk. Again, that's justiceunited.org.uk. Let's come together as churches and communities around the UK and use this World Cup and the controversies surrounding it as an opportunity to join in with, as the prophet Amos said, making justice roll like a river. 
Amen. So there you go. That's how you can do your part. If you've been watching the program today and God's put it on your heart that you want to be able to help do something to stop modern slavery, then this is just one way you can do that. We have International Justice Mission, Tear Fund and Compassion UK putting this initiative together, Justice United. And if you want more information, you can go onto their website, www.justiceunited.org.uk. You can either do an event where you invite people round to watch one of the football games together. You can get your church and community involved as well. Or if you would like to just donate towards any of them charities, then do go onto Google. Just search for them and you'll be able to find them. And you can see on screen there, this is the Justice United website um, to give you more information on exploitation and forced labour and slavery as well. So do check that out if that's something you feel God's put on your heart to do. But we do have some of your emails coming in. So let's go to you this evening. Thank you to everybody that's emailed in. Um, this one says, the Bible says it is for freedom that Christ sets us free. Galatians 5, 1. If we believers in Jesus took this seriously and became heart and hand committed to rid our planet of slavery, what a difference this would make. Howard, Revelation 21, 3 to 6, brother, what a scripture. I pray that over persecuted brothers and sisters as it's such hope. Amazing show, guys. Thank you very much. Ian for that one. Uh, Frank in Belfast says, Jesus answered them, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Keep shining bright from Frankie in Belfast. That's exactly the scripture I was just... Was it? <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. But I thought we're all slaves to sin, or we can be so easily because of our fallen nature. But, you know, God will set us free, you know. So, in a way, uh, we're all slaves. True, very true. Well, this one says, uh, it's from SJ, everyone, be it black or white or brown, that are anti-God and anti-Christ and anti-Bible are slaves to Satan. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? In a way, yes, yeah. Um, because they're carrying out his will. You know, someone who serves him, you know, is really like a servant or a slave, you know. It's a very fine line between slave and servant. Mm. I, I like that song as well that says, we're no longer slaves to fear, because I think oh, sometimes great, our yeah, emotions yeah. and our own thoughts can, can mm. enslave us, and especially when yeah. there's doubt, when there's lies in our minds, when, when we're fearful or emotional, anxiety, depression, all them kind of things can encapsulate us and, and make us in bondage to them feelings and be overwhelmed by them feelings. So I think it's amazing that it says in the Bible that Jesus came to break every chain and that goes for our emotions as well. The emails are right that we, we are slaves to sin. We're slaves to our emotions sometimes. We might not be physical slaves to other people on the earth, but sometimes we can be in bondage to things such as addiction as well. But we know that the name of Jesus breaks all them chains. Um, we've got a question here from Dave for you, Howard. It says, when you were 16, you could not, uh, have got out, sorry, could you have not got out of your contract on the grounds that back then the Lord would not allow you to sign a contract until you were 21 unless one of your parents agreed to it? Yeah. Well, I'm sure my mum would have agreed to it, but the thing is, when I think about it, uh, also my wages were dropped. Um, I was on £10 a week. Now, that was still a lot of money in those days, but it wasn't. Uh, as much uh, when you think of the, how much I had to work for that. My next professional gig was with Joe Brown and I got 350% more. I was on 35 pound a week, which is a, you know, as a still as a 16, 17 year old by that time, I was a, a, a fair wage for me at that time. Uh, so the Barrett Knights had uh, really got me under screw. Um, and really, I just couldn't relate to the fact that um, I had to be found that by the judge that I did not stand a chance. But that, as I say, set a precedent for many years, but how many more people were affected by that bad law? Mm. When, you, when it becomes a precedent, it means every time a case comes up with contract law where you're signed, uh, signed a contract uh, to do something and you can't fulfill it, you can't sue them, you know, and that's what we, my mum was trying to do on my behalf. But really, it sh my, my barrister was useless. He got told off by the judge three or four times. He was wet behind the ears. He'd just come out of university. Or ho hopefully it was only uh, kindergarten, I'm not sure. <laughs> but um, it certainly was a really bad experience. And, but what it did for me, how, how many days a week do I work now? 
Seven, nearly. <laughs> there you go. Because psychologically, I had a really bad effect on me. It made me say, well, do you know what? I am going to work seven days a week, sir. If, you th if that judge, when I meet him <laughs> one day, I'll say, yeah, I carried on working seven days a week, thanks to you. Yeah. But you're doing it for God now. Yes. You're doing it because yeah. God's put you on your heart and it's a mission yeah. and it's your ministry yeah. to do, do this. So it's not, it can be work <laughs> at yeah. times, can't it, Alan? Yeah. But you're doing it for a, for a love of getting the gospel yeah. out. I yeah. think that's the difference. Yeah, no, actually, I love, I love what I do. Yeah. yeah, I love playing drums, but I just, you know, if I end up in hospital, God didn't sack me when I ended up in Your hospital. Words, that was go, it yeah. with COVID, you know, yeah. he helped kept you me out. going. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <So. laughs> yes, well, we are coming towards the end of the program. So I do want to say thank you to absolutely everybody that emailed in. And it is such a heavy, um, heartbreaking topic and some of the images that we've seen and some of the stats that we have heard. So I do just want to remind you of the charities that are involved in this Justice United initiative. It is the International, International Justice Mission, Tear Fund and Compassion UK. So if you want to be able to get involved in Justice United and change the game as they're saying, then there's a number of ways you can get involved. So do go onto their website which is www.justiceunited.org.uk um, and you can help them charities that they stop uh, exploitation, trafficking and slavery and they empower communities to lift themselves out of poverty so they're less vulnerable to traffickers and thus compassion there they release children from poverty in Jesus's name and I think that's the important thing that these are Christian charities mm -hmm. so they have the heart that God has given them to really help the people that God has put on this earth God doesn't want to see people in any kind of bondage or slavery whether that's to sin or physically on this earth so we thank you to the charities that are doing um, God's work to be able to help them um, be free from sin Howard, is there any other scriptures or anything you would like to share? No, I was thinking, I got to the age of about 30 and I started to analyse what my life was about and I could see I'd become a slave to the system mm. because I had a, a car on finance, I had a mortgage, I had all sorts of thoughts of commitments and I said to the Lord, if I can get free of those commitments, you know, I, would, I will work for free wherever you send me. And uh, I had the most amazing, I don't have time to go into it, but I had the most amazing experience um, that got me out of uh, all of those problems. And I was free indeed. And it, but I, you first of all have to recognise that you really are a slave to the tax man, mm. to the everybody who wants a bit of you. And if you could be free of that, but you have to let go of the money and you have to let go of the fine things in life. And if you're willing to do all of that, then you, you're a man or a woman that has that freedom in Christ. Um, it's just brilliant. Amen. Amen. Well, we've got two minutes. Have you, is that enough time to get... I want to know what happened now. <laughs> You've left well, me okay, on a cliffhanger. <laughs> One was I'd read the scripture uh, in Romans chapters 10 and 11 where it talks about God uh, you know, did not reject his people Israel. And I was trying to find everywhere I could to you know, find more about it. I w attended a synagogue. I, I went to different churches and I started to learn Hebrew. And I got myself... I just got on um, finance a Rolls Royce. I oh, know, sorry, it was, yeah, it was a really nice one. And I got it from uh, the local garage in Isha. And uh, I got a phone call three days later. But before I got the phone call, I said to God, you know what, if you get rid of, if I can get rid of this car, this commitment I have on this car, I'm going to go to Israel. I get a phone call from the garage. Uh, you know the car we sold you last week? Uh, we'd like to buy it back. I said, what? <laughs> and I, he didn't know what the what was. Yeah. And, and the thing is that what happened is they bought it back, gave me all the money back, wow. my deposit and everything. I went to Israel for three months, worked on the kibbutz uh, and loved every minute. And I was free indeed. And I learned more about what uh, the Jews were all about as well and God's will and purpose for them. Amen. What an experience. And that yeah. just goes to show the will and purpose God's got for our lives, that when we are free, when we're not hanging on to material possessions or, or people or our emotions, when we're just free to be able to be obedient and live the life that God guides us to and, and commands us to do, then the freedom that we can have and the opportunities that then God gives us and uses us is absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you for sharing. I was fortunate that. enough to have two homes at that time, so I rented one out to some big uh, guy, CEO of Del Monte Fruit, I think it was, and that gave us the money uh, to live for the three months that I was away. So no car, no commitments, and I, I lived on four, $4 a month on the kibbutz. Wow, amazing. So I loved it.
Amazing. I would have stayed there forever. Yeah, <laughs> but God needed you here, Howard, to yeah. make Revelation TV. <laughs> well, we have come towards the end of the program, so we just want to say thank you so much for watching. God bless you. And just a reminder, if you want to get involved, do look up the Justice United Initiative and you'll be able to find out more on there. Thank you to Howard for being with us. God bless you and we'll see you soon.